I'd like everyone to please stand as you are able as we welcome our engineering alumnus and our 47th CJ McKenzie Distinguished Lecturer, Dr. Hugh Wood. As a tradition dating back to the Scottish heritage of USASC Engineering's first dean, Chalmers Jack, or CJ McKenzie, it is a tradition for our CJ McKenzie Gala lecturer and honored guests and dignitaries to be bagpiped in. So please join me in welcoming our 2024 dignitaries and USASC Engineering student bagpiper, Daniel Stalker. Good evening. On behalf of the University of Saskatchewan College of Engineering, we are very proud to welcome each of you to the 47th CJ McKenzie Gala of Engineering Excellence. You may be seated at this time. Tonight, we have the honor of serving as your MCs. My name is Corey Crawford, and I'm a fifth year engineering physics student. And I am Jordan Cho. I'm your fourth year engineering physics student. As we gather tonight as a community of students, faculty, staff, industry partners, and friends of the University and College of Engineering, it is very important to take a moment to acknowledge that we are taking part in this event on Treaty 6 territory and the homeland of the Métis. We pay our respects to the First Nations and Métis ancestors of this place and reaffirm our relationships with one another. As future engineers, the idea of lifelong learning extends far beyond the technical knowledge we will gain. And it is incredibly important to continue to listen to the stories and histories of those around us so that we may continue to learn from each other and grow as a community together. As our evening begins, we would like to welcome our honored guests, distinguished lecturer, Dr. Hugh Wood and his wife, Claire, Elder Tim Iashapi and his partner, Elder Kathleen Wapepa, the Honorable Gordon Wyant, Minister of Advanced Education, Mr. Marv Friesen, MLA for Saskatoon Riversdale, Brenda Black, a USAS Mechanical Engineer and Alumna and District Manager at Graham. We are also happy to be joined by numerous past distinguished lecturers and great friends of the college and university. Ron Graham, a 2012 distinguished lecturer who's joined by his wife and alumni, Jane. Mike Marsh, a 2018 distinguished lecturer and his wife, Maureen Marsh. Myron Stadnick, our 2022 distinguished lecturer and his wife and USAS alumna, Jennifer. Gil Ledresse, our 2015 distinguished lecturer, and our 46th distinguished lecturer, June Verhaust. We also want to welcome many senior leaders from the university, our president, Peter Stoichev, the university relations vice president, Cheryl Hamlin, our deputy provost, Patty McDougall, the associate vice president research, Terry Fonstad, the interim dean of engineering, Carrie Simonson, engineering's associate dean academic, Akindale Odeshi, our associate dean graduate studies and special projects, Rama Gokaraju, our Associate Dean Research and Partnerships, Jafar Sultan, and Mike Bradley, the head of the Department of Engineering Physics. We also welcome all the industry leaders, alumni, faculty, staff, and friends of the College of Engineering who have joined us. 
And of course, welcome to the more than 300 students who are here tonight. As your MCs, we are proud to be representing not only the discipline of engineering physics, but the student body at USASC Engineering. Given the long tradition of this event, I feel so honored and lucky to be your MC for tonight. The first gala was held in 1976. Dr. Mel Hussein, who is here with us this evening, and Dr. Joe Chudobiak started an annual distinguished graduate lecture series in the College of Engineering. They wanted to have an event that would honor alumni who had reached a significant level of achievement in the engineering profession. It eventually became known as the C.J. McKenzie Gala to honor a college's first dean, Chalmers Jack McKenzie. In addition to being the first dean of our college, C.J. McKenzie is known for designing and building Saskatoon's Broadway Bridge, informally known as the Dean's Bridge. The project provided jobs for many unemployed workers during the Great Depression. C.J. McKenzie was also a leader in nuclear research in Canada and became the president of the National Research Council in 1944. In 1984, when C.J. McKenzie passed away, the college adopted the McKenzie Dress Tartan as its own. We are wearing the tartan tonight, just as many others are as well. This evening's celebrations are about recognizing engineering excellence from C.J. McKenzie to our distinguished lecturer, to the engineers who are here in this evening, to audience this evening. Together, we honor the dedication of engineers and their true purpose, serving the world. We all aspire to follow in their footsteps. Because of the long history of the gala and its significance to the college, we are very grateful to our sponsors who make this evening possible. Our presenting sponsor is Graham. Our gold sponsors are Victory Majors and Co-op Refinery Complex. And our silver sponsor is ADA Architecture. Please join me in thanking them. We are also very proud to share this evening with the wider USAS community. I would now like to invite the president of the University of Saskatchewan, Peter Stoichev, to bring greetings on behalf of the university. Okay. It's a long way to get up here. Welcome, everybody. It's fantastic to see, what, between 500 and 600 people here tonight? 300 students, did I hear? Congratulations on being here. Thanks to all the students. I know there's a student at least at every table. Fabulous to see all of you here. There are 17 colleges at the University of Saskatchewan. This has got to be the biggest college event that the university holds every year. And it's really a privilege to be able to speak at it. I've come to many in the past. Nobody has given me a tie yet. I try to provide my own <laughs> simulacrum of a tartan. It's not the Mackenzie one, but uh, I'm happy to accept the gift. Um, <laughs> I'm here with uh, my wife, Catherine. Uh, she's a proud supporter of uh, this college as well. And I want to acknowledge our fabulous Minister of Advanced Education, Gord Wyant, who is here. We are very, very lucky to have him in that very important role. And he uh, understands and has lived the value proposition of great research-intensive universities like this one. Thank you, sir, for everything that you do. MLA Marv Friesen is here. As you heard, Saskatoon Riversdale, thank you very much for being here as well. Our VP University Relations, Cheryl Hamlin. Our Deputy Provost, Patty McDougall, is here too. I want to thank Interim Dean Carrie Simonson and members of the College of Engineering who are here this evening. Your leadership has been terrific, will continue to be terrific, and thank you so very much for all that you do. Our honoree tonight, Dr. Hugh Wood and his wife Claire and his family are here and we all really look forward to hearing what you have to say this evening to all of us. And to elders Tim and Kathy, thank you very much for being here as well and I look forward to all that is said there too. Ron and Jane Graham and their son Jeff are here too, and uh, I have to tell you that Ron and Jane and their family are the largest private donors this university has ever had, and their donations exceed $30 million.
They've donated to Vito. They've donated to the College of Education. They've donated in a very, very visionary way to this college, to all kinds of parts of Husky athletics, uh, and we owe them so much. And as Jeff always says to me, even publicly when he introduces me, thank you very much for ruining my inheritance. <laughs> there are other representatives from Graham Construction here as well. Thank you very much for being here. Callian, PCL, Wood PLC, March Consulting, Nuvista Energy, and other corporate entities as well. Mike Marsh, thank you for being here too, and wife Maureen, Myron Stadnick, and Jennifer, uh, both CJ McKenzie honorees. Thanks all of you for doing so much. This is a true community, and that's why this College of Education is so remarkable. This gala is built on the tradition of gathering faculty, students, staff, alumni, and associated industries to celebrate achievements in engineering. And on behalf of the University of Saskatchewan, welcome as we celebrate one of our own tonight, University of Saskatchewan alumnus and former professor, Dr. Hugh Wood. Dr. Wood is emblematic of so many members of the local engineering community, having earned his bachelor's, master's, and PhD in engineering physics at the University of Saskatchewan before going on to work with leading industry innovators, as well as serving as a professor at our university. Congratulations on a remarkable career and we look forward to hearing from you shortly. We are a U15 university, and the U15 is an organization dedicated to helping advance research and innovation policies and programs for the benefit of all Canadians. The UK has a similar entity. It's called the Russell Group. The United States has one, Australia has one, France has one, Germany has one. Ours is the U15. We're a member of that out of 97 universities in the country. Only 15 fill that role. The reason I'm mentioning it, though, is that we could not be a member of the U15 of this extremely influential group if we did not have a really strong, well-known College of Engineering. It's crucial to have a strong College of Engineering to be a U15 university. There's an amazing innovation ecosystem in this city and in this province. We have an inordinately high number of Saskatoon companies that are named in the Globe and Mail's annual list of the fastest growing companies. Many of them were started by University of Saskatchewan graduates, and many of them are peopled and run by University of Saskatchewan graduates, and many of those graduates are from this college. This is one of the fastest growing venture capital investment regions on the continent. We have an innovation place. We have talented researchers and students here from over 130 countries around the world. And we are one of the fastest growing IT hubs in this country. None of this would have been possible without a research intensive and innovative university at the center of it. And none of it would have been possible without a strong and historically influential College of Engineering, which leads me to say a little bit more about C.J. McKenzie. He was the dean here from 1921 to 1939. He organized important research in protecting concrete buildings from attacks by alkali salts in the soil. As you heard, he led the design and construction supervision of the Broadway Bridge. He was the president of the National Research Council from 1944 to 1952. He was appointed to that role by Andrew McNaughton, who was its president from 1935 to 1939. He was from Mooseman, Saskatchewan, and McNaughton is widely credited with help, helping invent the cathode ray tube and one of the early inventors and perfectors of the radar system that was so crucial, of course, in the Second World War. And during that time, C.J. McKenzie expanded the National Research Council labs tenfold. He became the federal government's chief scientist in World War II, and he was the main scientist planning Canada's science policy that shifted us from being primarily an agricultural economy to an engineering and innovation-based one that was globally competitive. And that influence of his remains to this day. 
He was president of Atomic Energy Canada and chair of its control board. And with the National Research Council President Stacy in 1952, he laid the foundations of Canada's modern scientific system. He brought Gerhard Hertzberg, who had worked here for 10 years, back to Canada, to Ottawa, to work at the National Research Council after Hertzberg left here for Chicago for two years. He brought Hertzberg back to Canada. And that's where Hertzberg continued the research that he had done for a decade here that led to his Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 1971. These were times when Canada was a world leader in areas of science, public policy, radar, nuclear energy research, and innovation. And that's why C.J. McKenzie has been described as the single most important figure in the post-war growth of Canadian science. If he were here, he'd agree that the foundation of a nation's innovation infrastructure is its pool of scientists and engineers. And so to all the students here, as you begin to formulate your career aspirations, consider Mackenzie and the crucial role that engineering will play in this province's and this country's innovation future. As you all know, we're moving fast to the final stages of the most ambitious comprehensive campaign that this province has ever seen, our Be What the World Needs campaign. It has a goal, a goal of $500 million, and as of last month, we have reached the $400 million mark, or 80% of our final unheard of to this province goal. The campaign is comprehensive because it supports student achievement, indigenous students and programming, our world-class research, and the creation of visionary spaces and places. And speaking of that last one, through this amazing campaign, we're committed to raising the money needed to create the Innovation, Design, Engineering, and Applied Sciences, or IDEAS, building. It will include an engineering design hub, with spaces for student design teams, a robotics lab, a virtual reality lab, the renovation of the main lecture theater, and event and meeting spaces. That's phase one. Phase two involves a public atrium and galleria that contains a cafe, industry and alumni spaces, co-op interview rooms, undergraduate labs, additional large lecture theaters, and more. The total cost of the two phases is a projected $90 million. We're very serious about getting this project off the ground as part of our Be What the World Needs campaign. We've been active across Canada and the United States fundraising for the ideas building, and we are seeing success. Your generous contribution to this project is critical now so that the College of, Education, uh, College of Engineering can continue to play the central role that it plays in this province and beyond. Together, we can create a state-of-the-art complex that will equip students, faculty, and our professional community to engineer a better future, one that befits the central role that this College of Engineering plays in the provinces and Canada's innovation world whose way has been paved by the extraordinary work done by C.J. McKenzie. Thank you so much for having me speak here tonight, and please enjoy the rest of the evening. Thank you, Dr. Stoichev. Our presenting sp sponsor, Graham, has been a long-standing supporter of the gala. Please join me in welcoming to the stage Brenda Black, District Manager at Graham. Hello. If I would have known Jeff was going to be here, I probably would have arm wrestled him to be up here instead of me. But I, I guess I'll give you the gears tomorrow. Uh, I'm Brenda Black, as mentioned, and I'm here to welcome you to this gala on behalf of Graham Construction. First, I'd like to also begin by acknowledging that we're on Treaty 6 territory and homeland of the Métis. 
It's really important to understand the long-standing history on this land and build a mindfulness of our, and present participation in this reconciliation. So I really use these moments to encourage everyone to use these acknowledgements and build on your understanding and for your own personal journey in this area and your own learnings. So I started working for Graham in the summer of 2000, right after my first year of engineering right here at the University of Saskatchewan. Obviously, I needed a job to make some money so I could go back to university the next year after, and I really did stumble on something great. I found a company that was made up of people that embodied the same personal values that I have, commitment, reliability, and integrity. Many of those people are here tonight. And over the last 23 years with Graham, I've formed a lot more than relationships. I found a family. And I also did not know about the opportunity for engineers in the construction industry until that summer, working on those projects. But working on all those various projects and being able to see what is designed actually come to life and having the pride that goes along with being a part of those projects and building them is really, truly fulfilling. So at Graham, we do have frequent conversations and discussions about culture, especially lately for anybody that works at Graham right now. But these conversations consistently go back to the foundation and fundamental role of work ethic. That work ethic is something we see embedded in the prairies here in Saskatchewan and reinforced through the College of Engineering program. The values of commitment, integrity, and reliability that form Graham's culture are woven into the qualities instilled here at the University of Saskatchewan engineering grads. This program has not only contributed significantly to the principles of Graham, but it's also shaped the incredible individuals that I am privileged to be surrounded by each and every day at work. So tonight we gather not only to celebrate the achievements of our brilliant minds in the field of engineering, but also to honor one of our own, a distinguished member of the alumni community who has ascended to a position of prominence in their professional journey, Dr. Hugh Wood. I absolutely look forward to hearing about the accomplishments tonight, and I am blown away every year, which is another testament to the product of the University of Saskatchewan Engineering Program. So tonight, let us come together and applaud not just individual accomplishments, but also the collective achievements of our alumni community, and really take pride in the College of Engineering and our Saskatchewan province. Thank you all for taking time away from your families and home to be here with us tonight. And without further delay, on behalf of Graham, I would like to welcome you all to the CJ McKenzie Gala of Engineering Excellence. Thank you very much, much Ms. Black. In celebration of our profession and college, it is only fitting to welcome our interim, interim Dean of USASC Engineering to the stage. So please help me welcome Carrie Simonson. Well, thank you, Corey, and good evening, everyone. It's, I'm honored to be here tonight and to welcome you to this special evening, which we hold yearly honoring as we heard our college's first dean, C.J. McKenzie. First, I would mention I've been interim dean for seven months now, but my affiliation with the college started over 36 years ago when I became an undergraduate student. And I've received uh, mas bachelor's, master's, and, and PhD here in mechanical engineering, and I've been a faculty member for, for 22 years. And through that journey, for my research and graduate student mentorship, I've been recognized as one of Canada's top natural science and engineering researchers. I've been named one of Canada's most outstanding graduate student mentors. And I'm currently listed in the top 1% of researchers in the world. But in the past five years, I've I've moved into a leadership here in the college serving as an associate dean. And the last seven months has been an honor and a pleasure to serve as your 
interim dean, our interim dean, the dean of our college. However, it's been a uh, difficult balance for me with, a, with an active family at home. And my wife, Virpi, and I have been blessed with 11 children, five in public school, the youngest in, in kindergarten. And as a result, I've missed out too much at home in the last few years and the last seven months. Re needed to rely too much on my wife, Virpi. And as a result, I've decided that I will not pursue this opportunity to be your full-time dean. But it's not because I don't believe in the college. There's a great future here, as we've heard already in the speeches. And this CJ McKenzie Gala is an important evening for us to connect to each other, our engineering, engineering community. And from the college, we're delighted to see so many alumni industry here tonight. And you students who have come out in, in great numbers in this celebration, maybe your first taste of professional networking and, and connecting with industry and alumni. And that kind of triggers my professor brain to give an assignment. I'd, I'd encourage you and give you an assignment. There will be no, no test or no marks, but take this opportunity to, to challenge yourself to meet two new alumni. Two people from industry, two alumni of this college, get to know them. If it's at your table, that's an easy assignment, but if you have to mix and, and, and meet, that, that'll be a little bit more challenging. But this room is full of wisdom, and there's tons of eager mentors who are willing to, to mentor you as our future next generation of engineers. So tonight, we will be honoring Hugh Wood, joining a distinguished group of C.J. McKenzie lecturers. For many, no introduction is needed because for us, Doc Wood, is he's affectionately known, as, is really an over-the-top figure for many of us in the college. He's an educator, an entrepreneur, entrepreneur, a researcher. And you will hear more of his immense accomplishments later on this evening We've had a taste of them. But what, one thing I would say, when I had the honor and pleasure to call Doc Woods and inform him of our choice, our selection of, of him joining this group, I was really touched by his humility. His recognition that while he has made accomplishments, in some ways, as we heard, a second year engineering position can lead to a career. Uh, Doc, Doc Wood also have exemplified this of opportunities and growing and, and building Saskatchewan. But all of it, you know, true to his Saskatchewan roots and I was just touched by his humility. I want to acknowledge our sponsors again briefly. You know, you, without you, this event would not be possible in this form. Thank you to our presenting sponsor Graham, and also, as we heard, uh, Ron and Jane Graham for attending. Also thank our gold sponsor, Victory Majors, Co-op Refinery Complex, and silver sponsor, ADA Architecture. Welcome again to Tim and Kathy Ishapi, our elders. Your presence tonight is so meaningful for the college. Thank you. Delighted to have members from the government, Gordon Wyant, Minister of Advanced Education, and Mar Fries, an MLA for Saskatoon Riversdale. And as you are here, we recognize the province's investment in post-secondary education and how this has risen by 3.3% over the last year, during the last year, to reach seven, 765 million last year. So thank you, Minister Wyatt, for your continued support of advanced education in our province and support of USASC Engineering. Thank you, President Stoicha, for your kind words of welcome and encouragement from the university and the uplifting of our College of Engineering. Thank you. We are proud to be part of this campaign that the, that the university is, is holding and we really see have a common desire 
for a strong engineering college. I want to take a moment to reflect on the accomplishments of our USASC engineering community. Collectively, USASC engineering delivers an annual economic impact to Saskatchewan of $775 million. Yes, that's three quarters of a billion dollars each year to this province. It's a big number. It's 1% of provincial, pro, uh, provincial GDP, and it's nearly equal to the annual funding to post-secondary education in Saskatchewan. And this economic impact is because of you, our faculty, our staff, our students, and most importantly, our alumni. Through your careers and startup companies, you are driving Saskatchewan's economy. Thank you from me, thank you from the college, and really thank you from every resident of this fine province. And a special thanks to our distinguished lecturer tonight, Hugh Wood, who has especially dedicated his career to grow Saskatchewan. May you and your lecture tonight inspire others to follow your path of building opportunities right here in Saskatchewan. With an annual impact of three quarters of a billion dollars, USASC engineers, USASC engineering has been quietly and efficiently delivering a 50 to one return on investment for the province. Nevertheless, the college is at a crossroads because of our limited operating budget and constraints of our building. They're hampering our, our ability to continue to deliver at our current rate and preventing our growth. While we produce 400 graduates each year, we desperately need to grow the college so we can deliver the full number of engineers needed by a province that's focused on innovation and growth. In the provincial growth plan for 2030, over 70% of the goals for 2030 depend on the expertise of professional engineers. In every sector across Saskatchewan, manufacturing, energy, agriculture, health, natural resources and technology, USASC engineers are delivering their know-how. In the decades to come, it's professional engineers, entrepreneurs, USASC engineering grads who will design, engineer, manufacture, construct, operate and maintain the projects that build a stronger Saskatchewan for our children and for our grandchildren. USASC engineers are engineers the world and Saskatchewan needs. Because of this, we are under undertaking strategic renovations and sharing some of the proposed renovations in virtual reality tonight. If you have a chance, go back and take a look. And thanks to the provincial government, a portion of, this, of the funding for one of these projects has been secured. We are also planning a building expansion. We have land and we have a plan and moving forward with expansions. We were thrilled when improvements and expansion of the engineering building, the ideas project became a USAS priority in Be What the World Needs campaign. And thank you for so eloquently raising that forward tonight, this evening, Professor uh, Peter Stoichuk. But we need nearly 100 million for renovation and expansion of this ideas project. We estimate that by 2030, this nearly 100 million investment will return an equal amount to the province each year. So please join me in amplifying our message. Share in your circles that a strong college of engineers is valued and needed for a strong and growing economy in Saskatchewan. And that the renewal of our building, expansion of our building is key to this. We are grateful for our proud alumni community and the support of the USASC leadership, industry, and the province. Working together, it will be possible to renew our building and ensure that we have USASC engineers we need to ensure a strong future here in Saskatchewan and beyond. We are excited about what the future holds. Thank you again for joining us this evening. Enjoy your evening.
Thank you, Dean Simonson. Before we start dinner service, I would like to acknowledge the utmost respect we have for our elders and knowledge keepers. Joining us tonight is Elder Tim Iashpi, who is from Cary the Kettle First Nation. It is customary to offer tobacco to an elder as a symbol of gratitude and thankfulness for the knowledge they share with us. Tobacco is a sacred gift that allows prayers and blessings to be shared by everyone's respective creator. This gesture is given directly from the heart. I would like to formally welcome Elder Tim Iashapi to the stage. Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, all the grads, and all the parents, grandparents, all the professors, the deans, all of you. It's so nice to see all of you as I stand up here and look at all the faces throughout this building. I just told the people in the back here to get my good side. <laughs> and I did not get the memo about wearing green so I'm sorry, but it's good to be here because it was just a few years ago that we couldn't gather, and many of you knew, know that. And I'm very happy that we get to do this and celebrate the new people. I met a, a girl here in her fifth year, and that's pretty awesome, pretty amazing. And some of you are going to go on, and... You are going to have businesses, and you're going to develop things that are going to be great for Mother Earth. And I always go back to Mother Earth because uh, she's the greatest gift that we could ever have. She's one of a kind. There is no other. Sorry. There's only one. So these are some of the teachings that I got while I was growing up, and I grew up in residential school, and uh, my greatest teachers that I always go back to are my grandfather and my grandmother. Without them, I probably would not not made it in this big world. Many times, they had my back, just like your parents, the deans and the profs. They had your backs in your tough times. That's how my grandparents were. They're not here, but I always acknowledge them and say thank you for helping me throughout my lifetime. My grandmother passed away when she was 99. Now, hopefully you engineers can do something about my health. <laughs> you keep me going past 99. So you guys are doing something and you're developing things for all of us, human beings. So with that said, I just say thank you for having me here, me and my wife. It's an honor to be here and to see the green lights. Oh man, it's so awesome. So I will say the blessing of the food in my language. I am a, a Cinnaboyan and now that you know that there's a Cinnaboyans, I will refer back to my Nakoda roots. I am a Nakoda, Dakota, Lakota. And I'm always using my language whenever I do this. And for all the engineers, Wanane Kawokna Wabaga Wigjemna. Dagonish, Wigjemina, Doba, Kokanawabaga, Omaka Tikane. I bet you couldn't translate that, hey? <laughs> I said it's 2024 in my language, in math. 
you want me to come to your class? <laughs> but in, in reality, it's really good to be here. And I thought I'd share that with you about the language and why it's so important. And today, it's really a must for our young people. I work for SPSD, and I get to work with all the young people, those that we are molding to become you. So I'm very happy and thankful to be here with you. So help me out in your own way. Let's say a prayer together, and we'll start this evening out in a good way. Ha de wakantang matogashi kushine. Ake wana hiwone wanane aknagahine wanane na penne. Pahane wanane oyati ne de. Ha de wakantang mi akna wanane. Chantu ne de wanane iabi ne de. O jak ne de. Ha de wakantang mi akna wanane o shango duta ne de. Misha ne de wanane hokshina mani pia magia. Wanane yabi ne, wanane snakwash no de, nishto wakan de, ha de wakan tang miak no, wanane wopuna ne de, ne wanahe hibi ne de, wanane eogi pia ne, wanane hokshina ne de, wanane wichan ne wia ne, ne wanahunga bi ne de, ha de wakan tang miak no, wanane de, waya watango wo ne de, they are one of snow yabi near the heart of a cantang miakna. When I were can't, they had the wakantang miakna when I need ashu near the. They are one of which are near the heart. When I need was in near the one on a wakan near the heart, they were cantang miakna when I need a water pea near the. They are one of my gear be near the when I need get you. My togo she near the. They were not chandi near the one on Makune Pidamaye. Oh. Midakiapi, that means all my relations. Thank you. Aho. Thank you very much, Elder Tim, for your blessing and for sharing your knowledge with us this evening. We are now ready to begin this evening's dinner service. Wait staff will be being, bringing out the salad course momentarily. Please remain seated at your tables and get ready to enjoy a delicious meal. For those of you who have requested an alternative meal, please alert your server at this time. You'll also find a card at your table for a complimentary bottle of wine. Any additional bottles can be purchased up at the bar. After dinner, we will proceed with the remaining program for this evening, featuring our distinguished lecturer, Dr. Hugh Wood. All right, everybody, welcome back. I hope that everybody enjoyed their meal and had some great conversations with all the lovely folks at all these tables across the room here. Um, in appreciation for the wonderful meal, please join me in thanking the chef, the kitchen, and the wait staff. We have now arrived at the part of the evening that we've all been looking forward to, the keynote addressed by Yi Sask, engineer and alumnus, and our 47th distinguished lecturer, Dr. Wood. Dr. Wood's impact and influence in the profession of engineering and beyond continues to this day. Dr. Wood earned his bachelor's degree from engineering physics in 1966, his master's in 1969, and in 1972, he received his PhD in engineering physics at the University of Saskatchewan. Dr. Wood is only the second triple USASC engineering alumnus to be honored as a CJ McKenzie Distinguished Lecturer. He began his career in remote sensing and instrumentation at SED Systems, now Calian Advanced Technologies then returned to the university and taught in the electrical engineering department for 26 years. As a solid leader, team builder, and problem solver, Dr. Wood served as the department head for electrical and computer engineering for six years. During his time on faculty, he was integral to the development of the digital signal processing stream. 
In recognition of his contributions and support, the 2C74 Electrical Engineering Undergraduate Lab was named the Doc Wood Lab in 2019. In 2000, Dr. Wood joined Wavecom Electronics with founder Surinder Kumar, becoming the company's chief operating officer. Today, the company, known as Vasima Networks, is valued at over $350 million. The Canadian Academy of Engineering inducted Dr. Wood as a fellow in 2010, recognizing his role in helping to grow the community from a, the company from a three-person startup to a significant player in the international telecommunications marketplace. With his understanding of entrepreneurship and dedication to growing local businesses, Dr. Wood has been a mentor for various startup companies. He is also an active philanthropist, deeply committed to his community. In addition to this, he is also a life member of the IEEE, the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers, and has served as a reviewer for the Canada Research Chairs Program of the National Sciences and Engineering Research Council of Canada. With all this, please help me in welcoming our 47th C.J. McKenzie Gala Distinguished Lecturer, Dr. Hugh Wood. Thank you, and welcome everyone to the C.J. McKenzie Gala. I'm honored to have been chosen to present the lecture this year. Are we on screen? Not quite yet. Not yet. Keep going. Oh, keep going, he says. OK. <laughs> I guess it have to be in motion before it kicks in. I've been around for quite a few years, as you could have uh, uh, probably heard by now. So I have a career story in four chapters, different but related but each with its own messages. Chapter one, how did I get here? First of all, I see we're on screen now. Now, at, uh, I realize that the room is quite long and it might be difficult to see some of the slides from the, from the very back. I'll try and read the text if I remember to do so. Oh, a wag at uh, lunch today said uh, the size of the screen and the distance to the back would probably limit me to three-letter words, which would severely limit my presentation as an engineer. <laughs> but as you can see, my name is two four-letter words, so we're doing all right so far. So chapter one, let me make sure I can... How did I get here? I was in the college as a student because my very stern high school guidance counselor sat all the grade 12s down with a stack of brochures and, and uh, catalogs from different schools and universities and insisted that we had to come up with a plan for what we were going to do when we graduated today. Now, I had never met an engineer. I didn't know any engineers. But when I came across a description of engineering in the calendar for the U of S, I knew right away that was for me. The guidance counselor then worked very hard to make sure, but I realized, now I never actually met Dean McKenzie, but I realize now that I could, now I never actually met Dean McKenzie, but I realize now that I could have, since our paths, CJ had taken, and I had just entered the college that year. CJ had taken, and I had just entered the college that year. CJ had taken leave from because the, he was keenly aware of service during the war science. Now, the McNaughton Gold Medal is presented to Canadian electrical engineers for outstanding achievement. And I'm happy to recognize our own Dr. Roy Billington as one of the few medalists in this elite group. So from this uh, distinguished formal, from these distinguished formal gentlemen we've just seen. The man I actually met in the trenches of 8.30 physics classes is this fellow. <laughs> Balfour Curry was a true pioneer in the understanding of the Earth's upper atmosphere. Having made detailed observations of the aurora and the weather north of Churchill during the second international geophysical year, 1932-33. Now it was actually Andrew McNaughton's pioneering work in establishing radio communication across the country and especially in the North following World War I, 
that led Canada to decide even to study the special radio propagation conditions in the, or in the north, and hence Curry's expedition to study the aurora, and hence the founding of the Institute of Space and Atmospheric Studies here in Saskatoon. One thing leads to another. Now on the farm, I had seen spectacular auroral displays during the solar maximum in, in the 1950s, and I connected with Curry's public lectures on the science behind the aurora and the high atmosphere. Now when a call went out from the Institute for bodies to help with the launch of balloon payloads to study the atmosphere, I volunteered, of course, and became part of the gang. Here we are doing a manual launch of a helium balloon. Three or four people gathered around the base of the balloon, holding it down and measuring with a scale how much lift there was as it was filled with helium. And several of us, I was included in, in uh, those launches, holding up the train so that it wouldn't get torn when it, by falling onto the ground. And then at the very end, there's a payload. So after launch, it looks like this. You can barely see the payload at the, at the end. These days, they're launched in uh, all over the world, but large trucks, and they carry tons of payload. We only had a few pounds or kilograms today. By the time I started graduate studies, some of the hot issues centered around ozone and what was causing the severe changes in its concentration in the atmosphere. This was before the time of satellites, and so the best way to get high altitude data was to fly rocket instruments to collect samples of the gases or to make optical and electrical measurements. I participated in this work for my master's and PhD programs with my distinguished supervisor, Dr. Ted Llewellyn, measuring ozone concentrations up to 100 kilometers where the atmosphere officially becomes space. This slide shows a Black Brandt version 11 or 12, somewhat larger than the version three I used for my work. When my instrument was ready, I took it to Winnipeg, where the Black Brandt rockets were manufactured at Bristol Aerospace, and everything was assembled. Then the complete package, including the fully fueled rocket engine, was loaded onto an old DC-3, and together we flew to Churchill for the launch. That was an experience. Now, I, this is a book that was, uh, as you can see, written by one of our former uh, physics department faculty, uh, Professor Gordon Shepard and uh, an author who helped him with the book. This is a very good book on the history of Canada's space research, and I highly recommend it for anyone who's interested in the topic. I used material liberally from this book. Now, the Canadian rocket payload engineering was initially based in Ottawa at the space and electronics section within the NRC, but they wanted to get out of that work for some reason. A group at the U of S was already building rocket instruments and jumped at the opportunity to bring the project to Saskatoon. This work was driven by Balfour Curry and by Professor Alex Cabatis in the physics department and his engineering partner, Dennis Johnson, seen here in an early photo. Now notice that what Dennis is holding is First of all, the cylinder is about uh, 40 centimeters long. It was a part of the rocket instrument. It was spun up to a high speed and then ejected, and so it could measure the electric field out in, out in the space adjacent to the rocket, and it would telemeter the data back to the rocket and back to Earth. This is part of SED's spin-off work. You notice there's a clamp around that unit, and it was designed to clamp onto an electric power pole and then there's a, uh, a lever at the end that would measure the vibration of wires. And it was to detect when uh, galloping um, conditions occurred and then you could uh, subsequently put on dampers. But this, this was a direct spin-off of the rocket instrument applied to some uh, real application on Earth. Now, I was a graduate student in physics when SED was formed and I worked closely with the group in those early days. But when my graduate studies were over in the 1970s, 
I had the opportunity to spend a couple of years in Sweden, continuing our work on rocket instrumentation and measurements of the upper atmosphere. In addition to studying ozone, we used optical instruments to try to understand the physical basis of noctilucent clouds. This is an amazing phenomenon of ice cloud formation in the 95 kilometer height range. At this height, the temperatures are extremely low, in fact, the lowest there are anywhere in the atmosphere, and the concentration of gases, including water vapor, is almost zero. But recently, it has been proposed that these ice clouds could be an indicator of increasing greenhouse gases, since methane rising into the mesosphere above that, the uh, stratosphere is dissociated by sunlight, releasing hydrogen, because methane is just CH4, so mostly hydrogen. The hydrogen then combines with existing oxygen in the atmosphere to form water, and hence ice at these temperatures. So if we see increased uh, observations of noctilucent clouds, it could be an indicator of increased methane in the high atmosphere. While I was in Sweden, I got to work with outstanding researchers, many of whom were refugees from Central Europe. They had a big impact on my views of the world, especially how after unimaginable tragedy, one can get back on one's feet and still contribute to society. But my closest peer at the Institute was a survivor of the wartime famine in Holland. He was an engineer and a mathematician who eventually became interested in atmospheric science and worked on some very early computer climate models as a mathematician. His name was Paul Crutzen. And a few years later, he was awarded a Nobel Prize in chemistry for his work on ozone and nitrogen oxides in the atmosphere. He was the first to show that nitrogen compounds from the soil and from fertilizers were having a significant effect on the atmosphere. He also introduced the term Anthropocene to indicate that we are in a period of Earth history when human activity is having a real effect on the Earth itself. I was privileged to attend Paul's PhD exam and it was one of the last big formal production PhD exams in Sweden. And it was conducted in English because the external examiner was from Oxford. They put on quite a show with black gowns, challenges, defense, debate, and finally acceptance. Now, during the time I was in Sweden, a major concern of atmospheric physics was global cooling, being caused by the buildup of aerosol particles from industrial activities, volcanoes, and high-flying jet aircraft, the aerosols were reflecting sunlight back into space before it could get to the Earth to warm the Earth. But soon after, however, it was realized the effect of greenhouse gases, such as methane, carbon dioxide, and especially water vapor, probably would overpower the cooling effect of aerosols. And the research focus changed to global warming where it remains today. Both effects continue, however, in a natural balance. Paul Crutzen, having examined the science of both global cooling and global warming, suggested before his passing a couple of years ago that enhancing some of the known cooling phenomena in the atmosphere might be one way to combat excessive warming. But that's a topic for another day. It's quite controversial. To do my small part, I generate all of my own electrical energy at home and in typical Canadian fashion. All the energy I generate from solar is taxed with the GST and the carbon tax and the GST on top of that, every single kilowatt hour. Half of it's paid by me and half of it is paid by my unsuspecting neighbors. <laughs> I can explain that some detail afterwards, if you like. <laughs> Chapter 2. See, we're getting right along here. When I returned to Canada in the mid-1970s, there was a fairly major recession happening, and I couldn't find any academic or university positions that I expected to find. I therefore used my connections within SED to get a starter job. 
I realized from this experience that it is possible to build technology companies that could provide an opportunity to live and work here in Saskatchewan for engineering grads. Of course, there were other companies growing at the same time, many of them coming out of our college, such as Develcon, Startco, and International Road Dynamics, to name a few from that era. At SED, we had good success designing and manufacturing a variety of products, including agricultural monitors, often based on research work from the college, and we took on larger and larger projects. Now, you may not be able to read that from the back, so I'll read it for you. Grain loss monitor. Designed and manufactured by SED Systems. We did have problems, however, and learned that great designs by hotshot engineers in the lab need to be thoroughly tested, not only on the bench, but in the field under real operating conditions. This might seem obvious, but engineers can sometimes take shortcuts and then get caught by reality. Now, SED was sort of in a corporate experiment, being one of the first commercial entities spun off from the university. One of the experiments was employee ownership through the purchase of shares, with, therefore, some representation from the employees on the board of directors. I was very fortunate to have been chosen as one of the employees on the board, and that was another great learning experience. I got to sit beside Sid Buckwold, a very successful local businessman, former mayor of the city, and then a senator. I watched how he quickly attacked and dissected a financial statement and quickly got to the root of any financial issue. That comes from running your own business for years and years. SED conducted a number of projects, both commercial and government. And with our leader, Alex Cavadas, being a researcher in radio wave propagation, one of the projects we undertook was to measure the microwave properties of sea ice here in the prairies. This was a time, however, of expanding oil exploration activity in the Arctic, and there was a need to survey large areas remotely by air. So here we are, out in a rural dugout, having hauled in 10 tons of salt by hand in the fall, then waiting for sea ice to form. This is a microwave radiometer suspended above the ice, and here we are taking down measurements by hand. One important discovery we made was that the microwave signal is substantially changed <clears throat> if any oil becomes trapped under the ice. So that's very important for, for monitoring in the Arctic where oil exploration was occurring. One of the bigger projects SED undertook, SED undertook was the application of electronic technology to monitor the health of dairy cattle. Veterinarians knew that an infection in the udder caused an increase in the salt content of the milk, and we thought we could measure the resulting increase in electrical conductivity. So work began measuring the four streams of milk coming through a milking machine using radio frequency antennas surrounding each of the hoses, a direct offshoot from the technology we developed for rocket work. After a year or so of good research and testing in the field, this instrument performed well and as expected, and everything looked good. Then we went looking for an actual customer who could put the product into the market. A large US company was identified and they were indeed interested. But, in their opinion, this health monitor would be a phase two product. Phase one, and more important to them, was measuring the quantity of milk produced by each cow in real time to replace the manual weighing currently being used. So what did the hotshot engineer say? Of course we can do that, no problem. After all, we had already designed and were manufacturing flow meters for agricultural equipment, sprayer monitors. So how hard could this be? Well, then reality started to hit. First, this had to be food-grade equipment, 
easy to clean with no possibility of contamination. And then the big one. It had to meet a stringent accuracy specification established by the dairy industry for what is called record of production. This is a standard basically created to match the accuracy limits of traditional scales. And so we were expected to meet those specifications. So why am I spending so much time on this particular project? Well, I guess it's because I ran into my first brick wall head first. While we were able to meet spec on most cows, we found that there was more variability in the physical properties of milk between individual cows than the measurement spec allowed. And I had no way to correct for these individual differences. So after a couple of years of effort and buckets of money, the customer withdrew, not only from phase one, but also from phase two. So we had nothing. This sort of ended my work in ag instrumentation and the division was eventually sold to another company. SED moved on to concentrate more on satellites and satellite communications. So later when a good friend of mine said they needed help in electrical engineering to do some teaching, I made the decision to go on to something new. Chapter three, the University of Saskatchewan. Now I was in for yet another shock. Even though I knew the basics of circuits and electronics from my physics classes, it was a challenge to switch from engineering physics to electrical engineering. But I made it and served for about 20 years in the department, eventually becoming head for a term. Now right back to first year, I was always interested in robotics and automation. I even took a psychology class as my arts elective to see if I could develop some understanding of the human mind and how it worked. So one of my first projects in the college was to supervise a group of students building Goliath. That's not right. Back on track. How did that happen? Anyway, this is Goliath, a mobile but not very intelligent robot <laughs> that assisted the premier in opening the new addition to the engineering building just a couple of years after I joined. Notice that we had actual prosthetic hands and arms and borrowed from the Saskatchewan Abilities Council. We used those hands for a number of graduate projects on grasping and tactile sensing and made some good progress in those areas. Now here's where we have words that you might not be able to read from the back, so I'll just read them out quickly. A robot gripper with tactile sensing and slip detection. An expert system for tactile sensor calibration. Handling of objects with an intelligent tactile sensing system. Now I also teamed up with other faculty to do some industrially oriented projects with a number of graduate students. Here's a brief sample of some of the work we did. Here's simulation and control of the dehydration process. Simulation of thermal and disinfestation characteristics of a bale dryer. Now those projects were sponsored by Agriculture Canada and they laid the foundation for our export of hay products from Canada into the Far East because the buyers insisted that there be no insect contamination in the hay that was coming into their countries. I also worked on the application of computer technology to electric power equipment to improve their safety and reliability, and even some biomedical engineering projects. So here we have fault tolerant microcomputer design for power system applications, development of an expert system for diagnosis of thyroid diseases, a knowledge-based system for tutoring bronchial asthma diagnosis. Now a big part of robotics now, of course, is artificial intelligence. And we're just uh, commenting before the talk here that there's a big demand for 
computer science people. If you can spell AI, you get a job, apparently. <laughs> but in the 1980s, this was only a gleam in some researchers' eyes. And in the early days, we nibbled around the edge of AI, using such concepts as image analysis, expert systems, knowledge-based systems, and artificial neural networks. Here we have image analysis for vision-based agricultural vehicle guidance. I think that comes out of my spending hundreds and hundreds of hours on a tractor just following a furrow around and around the field. I thought there had to be a better way. And then there's a neural network approach to analyzing multi-component mixtures and an artificial neural network model for periodic trajectory generation. So I actually dug up some research papers and used them to create an elementary machine learning computer pr program that was the basis for several of these graduate student projects. Little did I know that 30 years later and hundreds of millions of dollars later, serious advances would be made in AI research and business. By the way, much of the breakthrough research was done by Canadians in Canada, who, as is all too common, moved to the United States to develop their business from their research. Chapter four. Oh, we're really getting along here. This is the longest one. This is Wavecom slash VCOM slash Vesima. I'll say why in a minute. Now, a major turning point in my career came when the electrical engineering department was awarded an NSERC chair in industrial telecommunications. And Dr. Surinder Kumar agreed to assume this position. Surinder had come to Canada from India to do his graduate studies in Ottawa as a Commonwealth scholar. His work in satellite communication systems fit in well at SED, so he moved to Saskatoon to work for them. Surinder subsequently took the chair position since it would give him an opportunity to do more basic research and to develop local spin-off industry within the mandate of the industrial chair. Now this was at a time in the late 1980s when cable TV was gaining a foothold over traditional broadcast television. And a national satellite system was being built to distribute television signals. It seemed like a fruitful area for engineers to build some new business. First of all, television networks operate at multi-megahertz frequencies so that their signals can propagate efficiently as electromagnetic waves in the air or over wires or through optical fibers and can carry multiple channels simultaneously. The basic science behind this technology was developed in the mid-19th century by a number of people struggling to understand. And it was elegantly formulated in about 1860 in a set of four equations by the great Scottish physicist and mathematician James Clark Maxwell. Now this is on your exam, which you're passing out toward the end of the, end of the evening here. Now I'm at some risk here, actually, of mentioning yet another Scottish stalwart, stalwart Maxwell, after McNaughton at a McKenzie function. But I think I'll be finished before the marching pipes and drums roll in. I show these equations because they illustrate a fundamental unity between powerful mathematics, vector and differential calculus here, physics through, the sh through showing that electric and magnetic phenomena are joined at the hip and really manifestations of the same thing, and electrical engineering, since these equations to this day form the basis of almost all design work of devices based on electric and magnetic fields. Now back to television. The transmission is at megahertz frequencies for several technical reasons. One of them illustrated neatly in Maxwell's equations. Now you may not be able to see this from the back, but in equation number two, you can easily see, and it's quite obvious, that the magnitude of an electric field, E, induced by a changing magnetic field, B, depends on the rate of change of the magnetic field, 
dB by dt in equation two, and vice versa in equation four. The B field, magnetic field, proportional to the rate of change of the electric field. So what this means is that the faster the fields change, in other words, the higher the frequency, the stronger the induced fields are, and hence the better they propagate. Now I'm reminded here of a, uh, an aside that there's a satellite, you know, the Pioneer satellites are way out beyond the edge of the solar system, and they are still transmitting back to the Earth at multi-gigahertz frequencies, with a radio that's only about the power of your cell phone, three times the cell phone power, is all they're radiating from those satellites at the edge of the solar system. And we are receiving those signals here on Earth. It's just amazing what you can do if you design everything exactly right and match everything well. Now, back to television. These television signals, the TV, I mean the uh, multi-megahertz frequencies, also need to carry audio and video signals. That's what television is, after all. And they are much lower in frequency than the carriers. So these low frequency signals are combined with megahertz carriers in a process known as modulation. And this is the technology that's critical to this part of the story. The TV signals coming down from the satellite are in a unique form designed to be efficient for that medium, the satellite to ground. But the signals have to be reformatted and modulated for the local cable TV distribution network. In the 1980s, cable TV companies were buying equipment that could do this modulation from the United States because there wasn't any available in Canada. Now, Surinder looked inside these commercial boxes and realized he could do the same function, only better and cheaper than the existing suppliers. And so the company Wavecom, Wave Communications, represented, was launched in 1988 at Innovation Place. Surinder had put together a team of technologists who could build the circuits to implement his original design concepts. And I want to acknowledge here the skilled and dedicated work of the principal technologist, Gerald Heron, who put most of the hardware ideas into reality and built the core of the company. Now at this time, the standard products available to perform modulation in cable TV were single channel units. That is, at each head end, usually one in each community, the TV company would have to buy a different box of electronics for each separate channel of TV they were supplying to customers. It's a different design for each of the channels. Now, the agile modulator, using some of Surinder's original ideas, was a significant improvement in the marketplace since each box was switchable between all possible channels. If you look real close, at least those in the front row, you'll, on the right-hand side, you'll see rows of switches, They're called dip switches. And with those switches, you could set the channel that you wanted to broadcast. So now you only had to buy one design or one version of the box and then just set the channel that you wanted. It was much better for the TV operators. Seemingly small improvements like this channel agility proved to be very attractive to the market and our business grew. Now after a couple of years, it looked like the company would survive and even be successful. So Surrender began to think of building and expanding. At this stage, he invited me to help in the company using my experience gained within SED systems, including my experience as a director because there are certain things you need to do as a company. We started to look at some strategies for growth, and we came up with a very obvious ideas of newer and better products, more customers. Our key tactic was to start by attending industry trade shows, which would be ideal places to see what other manufacturers were selling and to be de and meet potential new customers. I think I was the first person to go to a trade show representing Wavecom. And I remember walking the aisles, showing anyone who would listen, our 2020 Agile modulator that I carried around in a plastic bag. It was a humbling experience. 
and these huge trade shows with all the big TV distribution companies and all the manufacturers around the world, and here I was walking up and down the aisle with a plastic bag. Now, we quickly learned that most potential customers operate much larger systems than we were used to locally, and they needed units with somewhat higher performance specifications and more physical power to drive signals into their larger networks. We didn't generate many new leads with our current product in the plastic bag, but we certainly learned what our market segment in the larger world needed. We also learned we needed to build a somewhat higher profile than one farm boy walking around with a bag of equipment. So the next season, we got a pop-up booth, got some signage made, and we rented some small space in the corner of the trade show. And we had our next generation of product, the A3000. Now in an industry standard rack mount package, looks professional, and 10 times the signal power, which is what the customers needed. This was quite successful, and we continued on this path with bigger and bigger booths, more engineers and marketing people attending, more products, more trade shows, more customer contacts. Of course, this was really hard work, taking away many weekends and holiday time from my real job and my family, and traveling to such obscure places like Orlando, Florida, Anaheim, California, or Las Vegas, usually in December or January. It was really tough. <laughs> now, this is a more up-to-date trade show booth that we have a little bit more professional, with a substantial support crew. Now, as soon as the company seemed to be stable and growing, Surinder resigned from the university and went full-time at the company. My contribution sort of decreased during this time as I was department head, until we made the decision to make a public offering of shares. And I, in turn, then left the university and moved to Wavecom as COO. Chief Operating Officer. The company was now called Vesima Networks for a number of legal reasons, in brackets, Philadelphia lawyers, <laughs> for real. <laughs> now, share offerings by smaller companies are done for many different reasons. I'll read it for you at the back, don't worry. To raise capital for expansion or for acquisitions, to buy out founders to replace with managers, or to facilitate investors so they could buy and sell shares, and some of the owners could also buy and sell, or sell shares, and also to give more visibility into the company in a way that increases business opportunities. We found that as we dealt with larger and larger customers, they were more interested in the stability and longevity of the company as a supplier than just the performance of the products. The products they could measure and evaluate themselves, but it was more difficult for them to develop confidence in a private, small private Canadian company. Being publicly listed forces the company to follow strict internationally standard financial reporting rules quarterly and to have managers and directors who are deeply liable for the operation of the company. It also makes all the financials and business affairs of the company public and open to examination by everyone, including customers and competitors. It was this aspect of being public that we needed in order to be credible to a larger and very conservative customers. Additionally, by paying a small quarterly dividend, we could attract more institutional investors who can only invest in, in dividend-paying companies in some cases. And so we could attract more institutional investors that would add to our market credibility. Credibility is everything for a small company competing in the international marketplace. We could also attract high-profile directors who use their experience and contacts in the industry to help us grow. Now, with all of that high-powered help available, the farm boy eventually retired from the company. I still own some shares follow the company's progress, and continue to, to, and continue to say, we are doing so and so. Over the years, the market and the technology made some significant changes. 
The first products handled purely analog TV signals. One centralized head end with analog TV to residences over coaxial cable. Then the advent of digital television came along and that was a major change. Now not only was TV digital, but almost everything else was as well, such as telephone and the internet. Now being digital opens up a whole panoply of new technologies, new kinds of modulation, mul multiple different kinds of modulation. In analog we had AM and FM, right? analog modulation, frequency modulation, that's pretty well it. In digital there are tens and tens of different modulations, each with their different characteristics and different strengths and weaknesses. Also compression. Compression is one of the major features that allows digital signals, for television for example, to come into your home and use less, less infrastructure, less bandwidth than old analog TV. You get a much better picture, your digital TV picture, much better, and it uses less bandwidth primarily because of compression. Uh, in very simple-minded terms, compression says if you have streams of ones and zeros, which you do in all digital stuff, if you find in a stream that you have maybe 50 zeros in a row, you don't have to send every single zero. You just say there are 50 zeros coming. And at the receiving end, it inserts 50 zeros, so you don't have to transmit that over, over the cable or over the fiber. You just say 50 zeros are coming. And then if there's a string of ones, you say, well, 35 ones are coming. And it, you insert those ones at the receiver. You don't have to transmit them. Therefore, you can save lots of bandwidth. And so that's, that's really the major step in how digital improves the uh, bandwidth efficiency of getting signals into your home. So what comes next here? We have new services on top of TV. That's really been a market mover. So we have internet. Internet services come on top of the TV network. And we're, the cable companies are in continuous battle, shall we say, with the telcos. Telcos are 10 times bigger. They're monopolistic, shall we say, quietly under our breath. And the cable companies really have to hustle to match the investment and financial might of the telephone companies. But they do. So, delivering internet, Wi-Fi, the advent of the cloud for data storage and for centralized communication, computation. The cloud is a sort of a data center. There's distributed, but there are large central places, and you have to carry all the information to the data center and back. So who does that? We do that. So transmission of data, digital data, for, for these new services, such as the cloud, and such as video streaming, all the movies and all of the digital, uh, the over-the-top kind of services that come on top of regular TV, that's all digital data, and we carry that. So these opened up immense new opportunities for us as a supplier of equipment to manage data, but we also identified some gaps in our product line and our capabilities. Now, we could have filled these gaps over the years by ourselves, but we didn't think we had time. The industry is moving very, very quickly. Now, one of the gaps we identified was in optical fiber hardware. So we acquired that technology from a large international company which was shedding their fiber business to focus on other areas, such as cell phones for 5G applications. And then we built a line of products with that technology. I think I have a picture in here. Now there's a picture. There's lots of nice big words and symbols at the bottom. Don't worry about it. That's not on the exam. <laughs> Basically, it means that this is a device that manages optical data, data, digital data that's coming over optical networks. So PON means passive optical network. 
GPON is gigabit passive optical networks. There are different standards around the world and different standards even within the country. There's XGS, there's IEEE, because the, the reality is the fiber carries different colors of light and they use these different colors to transmit separate bands of in, or channels of information. And so XGS and IEEE and these different kinds of standards have come upon, have developed for these different technologies in optical fibers. And the trick here, this box that Vestima manufactures is an all pawn shell. Okay, so it handles everything. Everything that we know about today. So, we've, as we say, we acquired that fundamental technology and then built products on top of that. Now this box is the same size as that a3000 modulator. But I asked chat asked chat GPT the other day my favorite research tool and said what's the capacity of this compared to our old modulator. And she came back and said there's 50,000 times more data handling in this box than there was in that original modulator box the a3000. Same size different different function but Still, 50,000 times more data managed in this fiber optic milieu. Now, we also found some gaps in our ability to manage with software the large amounts of digital data we were handling. So we acquired that capability by buying an existing U.S. company from Atlanta that we had been watching for years. We met them at trade shows and it was back and forth and we finally agreed to buy them and obtained this new software package to handle vast quantities of data in the network. Additionally, in the last few years, the company has been participating in an organization called Cable Labs. Now, you may not be able to read this at the back either, but just look at the middle thing. The red thing says Cable Labs, that's all that matters. This is an international consortium of manufacturers and system operators who meet regularly, look into the future, generally agree on the direction the technology needs to go, and develop performance standards and interconnect standards for the next generation of products. This has been an invaluable experience since we now regularly exchange ideas with the people who are influencing the direction of the business and the technology and make early critical contacts with customers. We now get to compete with other suppliers who are also in the consortium, by the way, primarily on product performance and features rather than trying to catch up after we see a competitor's new product at a trade show, which we occasionally were doing in the past. The consortium also alerts the chip manufacturers as to what designs they should prepare for the next generation of products. This new approach for product development has fueled the current growth phase. Currently, the consortium has, ident has identified an industry shift away from a completely centralized network as it grew, uh, grew from the olden days into a, what's called a distributed architecture. And we have found a niche in what are called edge devices which are essentially mini head ends distributed throughout a metropolitan area. And the edge devices interconnect to the core head end with high capacity optical fiber network. And they do much of the signal processing and then they interface directly with the users. So all the, all the processing of the data and um, all that heavy duty work that's done, usually in the head end, is now distributed out around the community and we do that. Now the company has always been ultra conservative in its approach to business development and operation. We had watched many startups and even some competitors make big risks then crash. We did not rely on external investment, although we had some, and we abhorred debt. So instead, 
we decided to grow organically, slow and steady. That's the trade-off. Either you bring in large buckets of money and try to make a, a quick go of it, or you work hard and build up your cash reserves and build up your product line over the years. Now, building up cash reserves carried us through a lot of downturns in the market. And even the occasional misfire on a new product happens. There is no truer statement for a small company than cash is king. Having cash on hand has saved us many times, not the least during the recent pandemic, when many companies were scrambling to take out loans to stay afloat, we were able to use our cash reserves to pay the exorbitant prices charged by chip manufacturers, and we actually grew by over 100% during this period. We even kept the management of the company in the family. Surinder San Sumit, a graduate of our college in electrical engineering and combined program, is now the CEO and he's doing an outstanding job of leading and growing the company. Our own two sons, Robert and James, also work for the company in Saskatoon as engineering managers. Now through the outstanding effort of the engineers and builders and managers, Vesima has grown to a company with the most recent fiscal year revenues over $300 million, with over 50 million invested in research and development, that's per year. Now since going public, the company has contributed over $1.8 billion into the economy, primarily in Saskatoon, but also in other provinces and countries where we operate. Now I know this is fairly small compared to the big local mining companies, of course, but we think it's a reasonable achievement for a couple of engineers. Now these are some of the, these are subsidiaries as of the last financial statement. We've got USA, Canada, Japan, United Kingdom, Germany, Netherlands, and a couple of companies in China. Some of these are selling companies and some of these are R&D companies that we've picked up through acquisitions. Now we have employed many, many engineers here in Saskatoon and also hundreds of builders and testers and marketers, and accountants and salespeople, and in general, the whole village it takes to run a successful company. This is a recent press release that gives an example of what the company has been able to achieve in its global business. I'll read it. Vesma and Tier 1 Latin America operator scored record video streaming performance for the FIFA World Cup. Now, since Argentina was in the final game, there were millions and millions of happy customers in Latin America, and they won, of course, all enjoying the results of our designs. So the operator achieves 100% uptime using Bessemer's media scale solution for the live video streaming plus proactive monitoring services. Now the cable companies are very, very sensitive to outages. You can imagine the uproar if during the last minute of a game the TV system went down. So this 100% uptime is a really big deal for them. As I say, there's no better advertising than to have millions and millions of happy customers. Epilogue. Now that's a clue that I'm getting towards the end, okay? One of the most successful tactics we used in the early days as a small company with limited R&D funds was to convince a customer to commit to buying a new product before we had designed it. Of course, these were not always earth-shattering new designs, but sometimes just add-on features that we thought a customer would like to have in order to improve their service offering. Of course, this tactic requires a lot of trust on both sides and requires a good understanding of each other's abilities and intentions. I will never forget an incident at a trade show where Surrender was making a pitch to a senior management group from Hewlett Packard, asking them to commit to a new design that we thought they would like and would buy. Early in the presentation, 
one of the vice presidents from HP, said quietly and calmly, Surrender, you don't have to convince us. We have followed your research publications and your company for years. And we have even successfully used some of your own ideas in our own designs. Everything we have seen is top notch. And if you say you can design and build this product for us, then we believe you inherently. We are ready to sign. And I saw the same thing happen a few other times. So it's crystal clear to me that your personal and technical reputation not only follows you everywhere and forever, but it also precedes you and guides what you can achieve. Perhaps this is the greatest lesson that I've realized over the years. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wood. As an engineer and physics student, it is so valuable to hear from a USASC engineering grad who built their career in Saskatchewan and gave many other USASC graduates, particularly EP grads, so many great working opportunities. The opportunities that Dr. Wood has developed so close to home have had a lasting impact on many USASC engineering students. Myself personally, the opportunity to work with a company like Callian Advanced Technologies, or SED, a company that Dr. Wood has a history with as an EP alumnus has given me a much greater idea of the possibilities that a degree like this has to offer. So thank you again, Dr. Wood. I would now like to invite Dr. Mike Bradley, professor and head of the Department of Engineering Physics to join us on stage to thank Dr. Wood for his lecture on behalf of the college. big crowd and um, yeah hard act to follow I have to say uh, before I, I make uh, some of the concluding remarks I do want to make a special uh, vote of thanks to our two engineering physics student MCs uh, Jordan Cho and Corey Crawford they've escaped but uh, please join me in thanking them uh, they've done a tremendous job and uh, really absolutely outstanding now uh, we in the Department of Engineering Physics are co-hosting the event this evening with the College of Engineering generally, and uh, we're really grateful for all of you attending here tonight. It's, it's absolutely uh, incredible to have such an outstanding crowd. I'm not sure if this is a record number, but it must be pretty close for the C.J. McKenzie Gala, so, so it's wonderful. We're delighted to have uh, our representatives from the provincial government, uh, our elders, um, and so many from the USAS community who uh, have come out, especially all the students here. Um, and I'd like to make a special thanks, too, to our Piper, uh, who uh, did a tremendous job. So. <clears throat> and also, thanks to, to all of our sponsors and our corporate and industry partners. It's, uh, it's really great to see the broader engineering community from Saskatoon and from the province represented here tonight. Without that sponsorship and those partnerships uh, this evening could not happen. So, so thanks to you all. Um, and so it's uh, really my honor uh, as the head of, of the department uh, of which Hugh is an alumnus uh, to thank him for his lecture this evening and his accomplishments as an engineer and as a, as a physicist and engineering physicist really speak for themselves. Uh, we're really honored to call him an alumnus of our department and of the college. During Hugh's talk, uh, you know, I'd be hard pressed to think of, of an engineer or a scientist who's had uh, as wide ranging of a career as Hugh has had. I mean, um, from working with Balfour Curry uh, in the early days, and, and just as a, as a note, uh, every single picture I've seen of Balfour Curry has him smoking a cigarette, so it's uh, some kind of icon. <laughs> Um, through work with, with balloon launches, uh, papers with uh, Ted Llewellyn on ozone work, uh, through to SED systems, uh, through even, uh, for those of you who know something about plasma physics, uh, work on a controller for the plasma position in Atokamak. It, it's really outstanding. 
robotics work, tactile sensing, and then finally, uh, all the work with Wavecom and then Vesema Networks. Uh, really a tremendous career, um, a fantastic lecture. And so I'd like to invite Hugh to, to come and receive a small token of our appreciation on behalf of the college and, uh, and our department. And so here you go. Thank you very much. Uh, tremendous talk. And I'm not sure if there's going to be a photo of that, but... Uh, Oh, you got it. Okay, great. Yes, okay, thank you. Sorry, it's hard to see with the green. A lot of green out there. <laughs> um, okay, and then I think our uh, MCs are uh, going to return. And thank you so much. Thanks. Yeah, for that photo op, we will just ask uh, Dr. Simonson to return to the stage for, uh, for the photo. As we now draw the curtains on the 47th CJ McKenzie Gala, I'm truly filled with immense gratitude for the collective effort that made tonight such a resounding success, and wanted to express this gratitude to the many people involved, especially Carlene Deutscher, Robert Greer, and the rest of the external relations team in the College of Engineering. So please. We also want to give a huge thank you to our sponsors, Graham, the Co-op Refinery Complex, Victory Majors, and ADA Architecture for your support. Also, thank you to Prairieland Park for being an excellent host this evening. To our esteemed guests and partners, your presence and support have added an extra layer of elegance and purpose to this evening. Our heartfelt thanks extends to the dedicated team behind the scenes whose tireless commitment and creativity brought every detail to life. As we bid farewell, let us carry the spirit of community and celebration forward, knowing that tonight's achievements will resonate in the positive impact we as engineers make together. Thank you for being a part of this evening and have a good night.